Hi, and welcome to Outlaw Bookseller with me, Stephen E. Andrews, writer, bookseller, collector. And today's going to be kind of an informal one. I have been talking for a little while about doing a video about science fiction terminology and book trade terminology. So it's a bit of both, really. So it could turn into a two-parter. But I just made a few notes and I thought we did this informally. I could do it a big sort of presentation with graphs and charts and stuff. But instead, what I'm going to do is just give you the benefit of my professional experience. And I will say this. Um, the thing with YouTube, there's a lot of people out there and, you know, they're coming out with their opinions and what have you. And as Harlan Ellison said, you are not entitled to your opinion, your, to your opinion. You are entitled to your informed opinion. So I'm going to give you some informed opinion from somebody, I myself, who's worked in the book trade for nearly 40 years. So this is the stuff that I do as my job and I've done for all that time. So it comes from a position of authority and knowledge and experience. So not to brag myself up too much, but that does make a difference. I mean, everybody can sort of say what they like and it's, you know, it's a, um, it's a democratic sort of platform, but this comes from experience. And so it'll mostly be experience and little just opinion for its own sake. So we'll talk about SF to begin with. And I want to start with an issue which, and this will annoy lots of people. And quite frankly, I don't really care because just because something is popular doesn't make us right. And it's, it's the first thing that comes up. And if you talk to anybody who has been involved with SF as a writer, a reader, a publisher, a fan for a long time, and I mean over 20 years and going way, way back, is the use of the term sci-fi. What I can tell you now is that you might use it, you might be used to using it, millions of people might use it, but it doesn't make us right. The fact is this, is that no professionals except those under a certain age, some writers use it, actually call science fiction sci-fi. In fact, if you use the term sci-fi in professional SF circles, and you notice I'm calling it SF, that's what professionals call it, you know, it doesn't do your credibility any good. And why is this important, you say to yourself? Well, we'll come on to that. But basically, um, in the sort of science fiction community, in terms of professionalism, we've always called it SF. There's plenty of people who work in bookshops call it sci-fi. The majority do it. It gives me great pain, I can tell you that now. And so let's go back to the origin of it. The term sci-fi was coined by Forrest J. Ackerman, most famous as the editor of the magazine Famous Monsters of Filmland in the 1950s, a much beloved figure in early um, genre SF fandom. And Forrest Ackerman started sort of working in the 30s as a collector, as a magazine editor, as an agent. He did agenting work for lots of famous people like Ray Bradbury. And, you know, he was somebody, he had a sort of complete collection of every science fiction magazine ever and what have you. And, but he was more sort of <clears throat> instrumental in promoting the schlocky side of things as much as people loved him and things. And he came up with this term and it soon fell out of favour with the professionals, even though it caught on with the journalists and sort of media figures and what have you. And I'm going to flash a couple of quotations up on the screen during this about um, what they felt of the sort of term sci-fi. And I think those of us who grew up in the genre, we, we sort of knew, I mean, I'm nearly 60, but this goes way, way back before even when I was born. And the fact is that you didn't call it that, you didn't call it sci-fi because it felt like a pejorative term. It felt like something tossed off, thrown aside, dismissive. And it does have that kind of feel to it. And it's a horrible sort of abbreviated thing. It's not even a conflation, it's just vile. So basically, you know, for a long, long time, if you went to a convention or you talked to serious science fiction readers and fans and writers, if you said sci-fi in their present, it was, you know, it was regarded as offensive. I'm just saying that it was really regarded as quite offensive and dismissive and pejorative. And it marked you as an outsider, somebody who wasn't really involved in SF. So SF, it always sort of was the professional community. And it would be nice to see people going back to that because sci-fi is a mass media usage. And I've said this before. The thing is, is that 
before a certain date, if you wanted more SF, you might have started seeing it on a screen, on a TV or a film, but you had to read because there wasn't very much of it around. And of course, there were no video recorders, no optical discs, no internet, none of that existed. Um, you know, if you go back 40 years ago, it was, those things were basically in their infancy. So, you know, you had to seek it out and it was still a smaller thing. And Star Wars was a kind of tipping point. So if you like sci-fi, this channel isn't for you. This is about SF. This is about science fiction as art and as literature. It is about it as film now and again, but it's about the fundamental importance of SF as a philosophical literary form. So if you're interested in SF writing and in serious SF as, a, SF, as opposed to just escapism, please don't call it sci-fi, call it SF, please do. And you know, I'd aim that at everybody. I've got friends out there in the YouTube community who say sci-fi and I do wish they wouldn't. Because, you know, it does rather mark you as an amateur, I'm afraid, if you do. So say SF. The beauty of saying SF is that it can mean a number of things. We have different labels, different usages for the genre. There's science fiction. There's speculative fiction, which is not something I use myself. I'll go into that at another time. There's science fantasy. There's also the technical term structural fabulation. And, you know, so if you say SF, it can mean all those things. It's also like Dada. When the Dadaists chose the word Dada, it meant rocking horse because they wanted like a nonsense word that didn't really mean anything. So if you think of it phonetically, E-S-S-E-F-F, -S -S -E -F -F, SF, you know, it can mean anything within that blanket. So if you call it SF, and it's also a mark of love and respect towards the genre. Anybody who really loves science fiction, once you discover it, once you sort of fall in with people who are well read in it and know this stuff, who really, really care about it, they all call it SF. Sci-fi is, is not the thing. So if you're offended by that, I'm sorry, but it's not really something which I feel is up for debate. If you talk to anybody over a certain age who's been serious about the genre, they all call it SF. So, getting that controversial point out of the way, we move on a bit. And a word which is massively misused um, on YouTube and, and it's also in so social media generally is the word trope. Now, the word trope has only come into common usage in the last few years. And before the last few years, the only place you'd ever really see it would be in a sort of criticism text or textbook, you know, of genre fiction. And a trope is an emblem or symbol. They are the things of SF. The, a robot is a trope. Starships are a trope. Aliens are a trope. A genre, though, is more than just a collection of tropes. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a philosophical construct which stands as a category outside other genres. Genres don't overlap. They're distinct. They're categories, but they prop each other up. I talk about this a bit in my um, video series, The Elements of SF, and there's going to be a new one coming soon where I talk about the three genres and how there are only three, realism, science fiction and fantasy, how they evolved and how they prop each other up as the only real genres there are. Everything else is a subgenre. So a genre is more than just tropes. What makes SF SF is the paradigm shift created by a novum, a new thing that creates a conceptual breakthrough. Sometimes the novum in an SF story is can be a trope. It can be a robot, the starship, an alien, what have you. Sometimes it's a situation, a dystopian situation is the most common. And, you know, a trope is not a plot point. A plot point is a motif. And, you know, I've seen people discussing fantasy online and I saw one tweet where somebody said, what we want is tropey this. Now, the tropey has a bit of a ropey term. And they were on about sort of the sort of cliches of character interaction and what have you. And those are not tropes, they're motifs, you know. So don't get motifs, plot points and tropes mixed up. Tropes are very definitely iconographic elements. Just to touch on dystopia, people sort of use the term dystopia these days um, because they don't want to use SF or sci-fi or science fiction. They, they, you know, they don't want to see things marred with that. Publishers particularly do this. They say dystopian fiction. Well, let me tell you about 90% plus of science fiction is dystopian. Dystopia is a word, again, that you didn't hear outside science fiction criticism and history. You didn't hear it at all until about 20 years ago. And a dystopian story is SF by default, because to create a dystopian thing, you need something scientifically explicable to happen, whether it's socially or technologically, but it's scientifically explicable, not magically explicable. 
or magically inexplicable rather, to sort of trip it over into creating that dystopian situation. So a dystopia is not a genre, it's a background condition, what you'll find within genre fiction, and you'll only find it in SF. Some people say you find it in the real world, and of course we do often think the world we live in is dystopian, and that's why dystopia is such a handy and useful part of SF, because it's a metaphor for the real world, and the best SF obviously is a metaphor for what's happening in the real world now. So with these things, watch the sort of elements of um, SF series, so there's more coming, and it'll give you more of an idea about my thinking around genres because people think they know what genres are and they often haven't sort of looked very deep within it so you know do look deep within and think think to yourself you might be able to recognize a piece of sf by looking at it but what makes it that what makes it that what's the philosophy behind it what's the structure that uh, makes a story into sf i saw a comment on um a video the other day by another youtuber where somebody said something absurd like they they, they thought that War of the Worlds wasn't science fiction and they went at this convoluted explanation which didn't explain anything in my view and they seem to be referring to the Steven Spielberg film read the book guys I mean the books are the sources this is the thing anyway enough of that a few more misused terms that you you see coming up now and again um, in social media and what have you are how you refer to books which are in series and what have you so first of all really you should assume when a work is being discussed that it's a singleton that as a novel or a collection of short stories it stands alone if you have to sort of feel that you need to sort of distinguish it from a series because increasingly in genre publishing publishers want to push series and they spread from fantasy into sf and it's an unhealthy thing because you just get more of the same diminishing returns it's done for commercial not artistic reasons almost every single time even in high fantasy it's done for that reason you get the same old things and in sf it present prevents you know really really important resolutions to stories where there's a second conceptual breakthrough and the world is changed i mean is there a sequel to tiger tiger the stars my destination by alfred bester no there doesn't need to be one when gully foil does but we're going into spoilers here do we need sequels to the great sf novels no they said it they did it they got out and the writer moved on he might have tackled the same theme she might have looked at the same situation from a different angle but the singleton is where it's at. So if you're going to have to make a difference and state that something is a standalone, don't call it a standalone. A standalone is a horrible conflated word. Say singleton, that's the correct term. It's a singleton. And you'll see that in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction that will come up. If um, there are two books in a series, this another dreadful term that's come from nowhere and this is probably made up by somebody who is working in publishing probably as an intern who got the job of having to write copy for an AI an advanced information sheet um, to promote the book and that's duology a two book series is not a duology again it's an ungainly ugly word a two book series is a diptych it always has been if I go back to the early 80s, Stephen Donaldson, where there was that little series of two books, A Man Rides Through, Mordant's Need, um, was I can't remember which was the title of the actual series, but that was promoted as a diptych. That's what it said on the back of the book. That's the correct term. So don't use a term which has been made up by somebody who doesn't know what they're talking about. Go with diptych, and it's a more beautiful word. And that brings us on to you know a trilogy. A trilogy, of course, would be a triptych. Trilogy is more long established for three books, and that's absolutely fine. So when you come to a four book series, this is where we get the really ugly one. We get people calling a four book series a quadrilogy. There is no such word. The word quadrilogy was coined by somebody in marketing when the first version of the Alien film box set came out, the Alien Quadrilogy. And they did that because they didn't know the word tetralogy. The correct term for a four book series is a tetralogy. OK, has been for decades and decades and decades and decades. So a singleton, diptych, trilogy, tetralogy. What's a five book series? It's a quincunx, a quincunx. You could say quartet for tetralogy. That's OK. But a quadrilogy, that's an ugly term. You can tell it's conflated and it's made up quadrilogy yuck 
So, you know, <laughs> go with it. So Singleton, Diptych, Trilogy, Tetralogy, Quincunx. You could call it Tetralogy or Quartet. I'll let you off with that one. And, you know, maybe it's just my opinion. But these are the terms which I've been using and I've seen used in the book trade since the early 1980s. OK, so these are all established long before these recent conflated words. And there's always the old argument of the language evolves, things move on. Well, sometimes language devolves. And if you want to read something which shows that, read Ridley Walker by Russell Hoban, a great post-apocalyptic um, science fiction novel. Just because language changes doesn't make us right. I mean, look at 1984 Newspeak, in that words are eradicated because they have unfortunate political meanings, because they don't reflect the orthodoxy of the time. So I'm saying to you, if your peers are saying sci-fi and they're saying standalone and they're saying quadrilogy, step aside from the crowd and be yourself cleave to something which is older which is more established and is more beautiful in its sound because euphony you know the beauty of the english language is really important so anyway a bit of a rant there on that think of it what you will so we kind of want to move on now really to um to other things a couple more bits of sf terminology if you know anything about the genre, you'll soon discover that a lot of the sort of early classics of genre SF, and by genre SF, I mean the type of SF which came out of the magazine tradition, when back in 1925, Hugo Gernsback started an SF magazine, and he called it science fiction then, terrible conflated word. A year later, a fan in the letters page put science fiction, much, much better. So, you know, if you're coming out of that tradition, and um, things which are published in magazines as short stories or as serials that were later fixed up into books in the 1950s. So the fix up is a classic example. So if you take A. E. Van Vogt's novel, The Voyage of the Space Beagle, which there's a video about on this channel and it tells you about how that book is the kind of source material for Alien, for Forbidden Planet, for Star Trek, that was really, really important. And it's a great book. That's a fix up of four stories from a magazine serial uh, over various years from 1937 to the late 40s with a bit of linking material. So that's a fix up. So a fix up is a common thing. If you look at the SF books published in the 50s and 60s, many of which are the classics of today, the things which are in Gollock's masterworks and what have you. You also have the VT, the variant title. This is a more uncommon thing. Um, it's not so much pops up much these days because of the way that things are marketed. Things are marketed more globally because of the internet. But back at one time, you would have books which would have a different title in the UK to the US. Classic example I mentioned earlier is Alfred Bester's Tiger Tiger, AKA also known as The Star's My Destination. And these days it has The Star's My Destination on the jacket pretty much everywhere. But that wasn't the title. The title was Tiger, Tiger and a reference to the William Blake poem, Tiger, Tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? Marvellous stuff. That's what Bester wanted. The star's my destination. How bland is that? How, how workaday. So that's an example of a variant title. And I think it was known as the star's my destination in the States. And in the UK, it was always called Tiger, Tiger. And I think his original preferred title was Tiger Tiger. So that's a VT, a variant tile. Doesn't happen much now, as I say. Another example is there's a book called Gold the Man by Joseph Green. And in the US, it's called something, is it some time behind the eye or something like that? One of you will know, I'll put it up on the screen. So variant tiles pop up now and again. So you'll see VT used occasionally. Okay, something that gets people confused as well is anthologies and collections and omnibuses. Let's get the term, terminology right. Okay, an anthology is a collection of stories or pieces by diverse hands under a single editor. There could be two or three editors, but the point is the things which comprise the book are all by different writers. So that's an anthology. So if you go to an anthology, it'll be something like this here, this issue of New Writings in SF, number 17, edited by John Carnell. Okay, so he's the editor, that's an anthology. Then of course, you get a collection, which is different. A collection is short stories or pieces by a single writer, okay? So that's the difference between an anthology and a collection. So you don't get an anthology. If you get an anthology of stories by Robert Silverberg, if the stories are by Robert Silverberg, that's not an anthology, it's a collection. If it's edited by Silverberg and has lots of different writers in it, 
that's an anthology okay so we've cleared that up omnibus what's an omnibus an omnibus is a book which will contain two or more books by the same writer usually so if you get something like years ago you don't see them much now there'd be things like four great sf novels by arthur c clark so you'd get four novels in one volume that's an omnibus okay you can have an omnibus which is by different hands so then it becomes an omnibus anthology okay you see where that goes got it so that's anthologies collections and omnibuses sewn up 